Okay. So for the next two weeks, we're going to be assuming that firms are price takers, which means that uh, over the small range of quantities that a firm varies, uh, the prices that the, will prevail on the market will not change by very much. That is, the demand curve that the firm faces is uh, flat unless the firm produces a very large amount relative to what uh, would be likely for it to want to produce. And we'll give some foundations for this in lecture 16, uh, but for the moment we're just going to assume that price is constant, the firm's take price is given. Um, and uh, in particular, in this case, the firm's production function, uh, sorry, profit function will then be P times Q minus their total cost. And um, Adam, where's Adam? Adam, yeah, hey. Uh, what's going to be the firm's first order condition then? Um, it would be where uh, price equals marginal cost. Exactly. So you differentiate that and you get price from the first because price is fixed and then the derivative of total cost is marginal cost and you set those equal to each other. Right? So then we can derive the supply function from this. Um, so in particular, if we invert the marginal cost curve, then we get that the supply of P is equal to Q. The supply is the inverse of the marginal cost curve. So let's return again to the Cobb-Douglas example we had from before. So their marginal cost, remember, was K times the output to some uh, power alpha. Um, if that marginal cost is not increasing, then there's going to be a problem because, uh, uh, well, we'll, well, we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, let's for the moment assume that alpha is greater than zero. Um, so then what is the supply function going to be? Does anyone want to uh, remind me of your name? Wesley. Wesley, yeah. So uh, I guess the, the alpha root of marginal cost over K. Exactly. Of price over K, right? Price over K. Exactly. Okay. So this is the most <coughs> fundamental supply equation. Uh, and typically, it'll just be this marginal cost curve that is the su firm's supply. However, two problems can arise. One is that firms are not going to produce until they make a profit. That is, until their marginal cost curve is above their average cost curve. If they're asked to produce at a pri price where that's below their uh, average cost curve, even if it equals their marginal cost curve, they're not going to want to produce there. So for example, um, many airlines will shut down a route even if the marginal cost of the additional customer is uh, much less than the price that they're charging if there aren't enough people traveling on that route because there's a fixed cost of traveling that route at all, which is that they have to you know, bring the airline plane to the gate and all that sort of stuff, right? Okay. The second possibility is that marginal cost intersects uh, price at multiple points, right? And in this case, the firm is going to choose the most profitable point. Um, and in particular, it must be a point where the marginal cost intersects the price from below to above, because a point where it intersects from above to below is actually a minimum. Of the average of the total cost, a uh, total profit, rather than a maximum. But among those, it's going to choose the ones that um, the one that has the most uh, area underneath it. Let me see if I've got a picture of that. Yeah. Um, and this can happen especially if there's a lot of quasi-fixed factors. So it might be that you know my marginal cost is increasing but then I buy an additional factor and then the marginal cost goes back down and so it can have a wavy pattern like that at least in principle. So um, what this says is that uh, and a competitive firm will never have increasing returns to scale. The reason is that, um, let me show you a picture, so um, imagine that like the price is here, right? 
Well, then the firm is going to produce here, but as it starts to rise, there will be another intersection with, there will be two intersections here. Now, where is the firm going to produce? If the price is down here, it could either produce at this point, or it could produce at this point or this point. Now, this point is an intersection in the wrong direction. And the way you can see that they never want to do that is that they take losses of this amount, but then they get no gains. So they're never going to want to do that relative to producing at this point. Now, would they want to produce over here? Well, they get this amount of gains, and they take this amount of losses. The losses are bigger than the gains. But if now the, um, now the price rises to this point, well, then the amount of gains that they get from producing over here about equals the amount of losses they get over here. If it raises higher, right, then the losses that they take are only the small area over here, but the gains are this big area down here. So then they'd want to produce over here. So what this is actually going to look like, the supply function is not going to be the marginal cost curve. Instead, it's going to be marginal cost up to this point, then it's going to be flat, and then it's going to go over here, and then it's going to be flat again at some point where those two areas are equal, and up again. And so even though it has a marginal cost curve that's decreasing in certain points, it's never going to act as if it has a marginal cost curve that's decreasing at those points. It will always act as if it has something that maybe has some flat sections, but that is always weakly increasing. Here's a, another picture of what I was saying. So the marginal cost curve um, down here, if the price was down here, the firm wouldn't produce because its average costs because it has some fixed costs, are still above uh, the price that's occurring. So they're only going to charge a price. They're only going to produce once they're above this average cost curve. OK. So um, the reason that a firm can never have increasing returns to scale throughout the full range, right, is then the marginal cost curve will only intersect from above to below the uh, price, right? And that will be a local minimum. So either the firm will produce nothing or they'll produce an infinitely large amount, right? And uh, if they produced an infinitely large amount, they would no longer be a competitive firm and the prices would start to move, right? So that's the sense in which market power acts as a firm of decreasing returns to scale. It offsets those increasing returns to scale because at some point as you start producing more, uh, you start having to deal with the fact that your price is going to fall. Okay. So producer surplus is price times quantity minus total cost. We can also re-express that as price minus average cost times quantity. Or we can re-express it as the area between price and the marginal cost curve. Let me show you that. Um. <coughs> so we, if we have price here and we have no fixed costs, we've got a marginal cost curve going like that, right? The area between price and marginal cost, we add all those up, those, that's also <coughs> equal to the profits, right? Because that's saying on each unit, how much profit do we make on that unit and adding that up over all the units. Um, you can also measure that <coughs> by integrating over the quantities. Um, yes, okay. So, so that area can also be measured using uh, the change of variables. Uh, sorry, by integration by parts, by um, the quantity times the slope of the marginal cost curve at that point. And that is just equivalent to adding up rather than vertically. For each price, you take the <coughs> length of the slice <coughs> that you need to get out to the supply curve. So you can integrate the supply curve along the prices as well. 
because those are two different equivalent ways of measuring this area here. So these are all equivalent ways of measuring that area that corresponds to the profits. Yeah, Philip? Um, it somehow seems that the ones that involve marginal cost, the ones that involve average cost, are different because in like a zero economic profit equilibrium, the ones that in like definition one could be zero if average cost is equal to price, uh, but number two could be strictly positive. Well, so if there's no fixed cost, these things are completely equivalent. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the basic stuff. And now I'm going to turn to stuff that I think is quite a bit more interesting, which has to do with production over time and how we interpret production over time. Okay. So when we talked about supply, we were saying how much do you produce in a given unit of time, right? Because otherwise, how do we interpret what it means for your production to be X? Well, it's got to be over some amount of time. I mean, that's not your production forever. That's not your production just today. It's maybe your production over a month or over a year or something like that. But we didn't explicitly talk about that so far. And how you respond to a change in the price depends on what that length of time is, right? Um, for example, if uh, the price doubles just today, maybe there's nothing that you can do about that. You can't produce any more. You've already produced, right? There's just no, nothing you can do. If, if price increases for a long period of time, maybe you'll build a bunch of factories to produce more and hire a bunch of workers if it only increases for one month, right? So depending on the time over which something changes, how many things you can adjust and therefore how much you can react to that price change uh, can be very, very different. <clears throat> so whether you are more reactive in the long term or whether you're less reactive in the long term, that is, by long term I mean if you have a long period when you expect the price to have changed, depends on whether the things that you use to produce are what are called intertemporal complements or intertemporal substitutes. Um, so Bharat, yeah. um, what is the definition of an intertemporal complement or a durable good? Uh, so that would be something that <coughs> wouldn't be able to change easily um, over a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So like um, that would be like a factory yeah. or relationships with other people. Yeah, that's right. So an intertemporal complement or durable is something that lasts for some fixed, non-trivial period of time. And that while over time it might depreciate, you can't just get rid... It would be very costly to get it and then get rid of it immediately because it's going to last for some time and you're just going to be wasting it, basically otherwise. So it's something that doesn't make sense to change uh, frequently and therefore it's cheap to use during its lifespan but once its lifespan is over it's very expensive to use again, right? So a classic example of this would be where you choose to live permanently, right? It would be very costly if you had to like move from Chicago to New York you know every week, right? you, uh, you want to have one place that you have for some significant duration of time and then maybe you can make a costly, durable move, right? Uh, and Bart, Bar what about um, intertemporal substitutes or storable slash exhaustible goods? How would you uh, define those? So those would be things that you could, um, like, change more easily. So, uh, suppose, I guess, like, input factors, right? Or more input factors that can be changed in the short term more easily. Yeah, so these are actually things that can be ch changed more easily in the short term than they can be in the long term. It's actually costlier to change them in the long term than in the short term. They're, they're the opposite 
of these other ones. So these are things that last for you know, a very long time. You can store them for as long as you want, but there's only so many of them around for you to use. If you use it today, you can't use it tomorrow. Um, this makes short-term changes cheap because you could always consume it today rather than consuming it tomorrow. But long-term changes are essentially impossible because you can't consume more both today and more tomorrow, right? And these are things that are expensive every time you use them, but they last essentially forever. So an example of this would be a vacation. It's very cheap for you to like, rather than taking your vacation in a month's time, to take it today. But it would be very expensive for you to take more vacations both this month and next month, right? Because you only have so much vacation time or, you know, you'll get bored of taking vacations, etc. Now, all of this depends on context, but let me give you some typical example, examples of things that are durable versus storable. So, something that's typically considered very durable is entry by firms into countries or industries or how much education you get. These are things like if I decide to enter an industry, I'm going to be stuck there for a while, right? Or if I get an education in a certain thing, that's going to last me for most of my life, right? Uh, yeah, Rishi. So, real quick, um, when you say entry by firms into countries or industries, is that the firm like entering its own niche of the country or is that an individual entering your firm? So it's like... No, no, a fir a, the firm like setting up shop in a country. Um, another, uh, yeah. I'm just wondering for education, what would be the equivalent of flying between New York and Chicago every week? It would be like being an econ educated as an economist today and being educated as a biologist tomorrow. That's like almost impossible to imagine you doing, right? I'm not even sure it's feasible to do well, that, right? Education as an economist is constantly stored, so you're not giving it up when you move to become a biologist. That's why I'm having difficulty with the parallel. Well, I mean, like, what I'm saying is being today educated primarily as an economist and tomorrow educated primarily as a biologist is a very hard thing to do. I mean, you could be educated as both, both for long periods of time, but it would be very hard to, like, switch your primary education from day to day. Right, it sort of like lasts you, whatever it is, for your whole lifetime. Okay, I get it. Yeah. So another example of this are like um, cultural or political or economic or social institutions, right? Um, or your religion. These are all things that like stick with a society for a very long period of time, right? If a society is Confucian versus if a society is, uh, you know, Islamic, those are things that don't change overnight in response to transitory factors. They're things that endure for a very, very long period of time, and it would be very costly for a society to ch completely change over those things. In fact, one definition of an institution versus a policy is a policy is something that can change quickly. An institution is something that changes very slowly. Yeah, Adam? Um, I had a question, like, for example, education um, or entry by firm, how does that depreciate over time? Well, I mean, uh, Education is a classic example of something that depreciates over time, right? If you get an education in economics right now, as time goes on, you are going to fall behind the, what's cutting edge in economics, right? Uh, entry by a firm depreciates over time because, you know, if I come into an industry, like I may make a big investment in like being up on that industry, but unless I'm continually renewing that investment, uh, you know, I'm not going to be on the cutting edge, right? Uh, remind me of your name again. Tanner. Tanner. Uh, I was wondering about the religion, because religion can last basically forever. Yeah. And uh, it will, so if you this last, <coughs> sorry, this last for a fixed period of time. Well, so that, that, that maybe that's true, but I, I, I'm not sure that's really true, because, you know, people have to continually make investments in order to, like, stay a member of their religion, right? And it would be very costly for them to make the investment to join another religion, but if they did, it would again last, you know, it would last a long period of time. But again, they'd have to continually renew it. So I actually think religion does depreciate. It's a big investment, but it does depreciate. You can, people lapse out of their religions over time. But it's not like using it depreciates it at all. I mean, in fact, if using it probably appreciates it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's from the perspective of 
like the individual as opposed to society? Yeah, so in the religion, we were talking about individuals, uh, but societies have religions too, usually. I mean, usually religion is not just purely an individualistic property. And institutions are definitely a social property. But, um, like, how would that depreciate over time? The, the religion? Yeah. Well, I mean, look at what's happened in Europe, like, over the last hundred years to Christianity. Like, there hasn't been nearly as much social investment in renewing people's Christian faith, and it's gradually been depreciating. It takes a long time, and it happens gradually, but, but it's definitely been happening. <coughs> Marxism depreciated as an ideology in the Soviet Union, because there was initially a like, huge amount of like, building enthusiasm for Marxism, but then there, there was less and less investment in that, and it started to depreciate. Yeah, Austin. Are there any good like natural experiments that have been done on like the value of religion, for instance, or relative cost and benefits of different religions? There's a little bit, but not a ton. There's definitely some papers on that. Um, somewhat durable factors are like machines, job experience. So job experience is something that you you forget, as we saw. Uh, in those graphs that I showed you the other day more easily than you forget your education. Uh, machines depreciate uh, over time. Uh, physical plants also uh, uh, depreciate somewhat, but they're less durable than our, um, than our entry into an industry, right? Um, yeah? Um, when you're class Specifying these um, very durable, does durable mean a long period of time or more of a durable trait, meaning it, it lasts and can be used an, a pretty much unlimited amount versus I, a machine has I'm, maybe a very large buffer? I'm trying to classify them in terms of the strength of intertemporal complementarity rather than the time lag, but it gets mixed up because they're sort of related. Because, you know, the thing is, like, my durability from today to tomorrow is stronger the longer it lasts because it's had lo less time to depreciate. So they're sort of mixed up uh, in some sense. Yeah, Kristen. Since we're kind of going on, like, a continuum here from durable to storable, yeah. are we taking into account on the somewhat durable if use depreciates them at all, or are we not worried? Because, like, for machines, use could depreciate, but job experience, not so much. Well, I, I really think it's, like, what's the binding constraint? You know, like if something is going to be so durable, like if, if it's going to last for such a long period of time that the main thing that ends up depreciating it, like over its lifetime, is its use, then it's historical. If it's something that, like, where use will depreciate it a little bit, but like the main thing that ends up being like the binding thing is that you're going to run out of time to use it, and so you might as well use it more while it's there, then it's really historical. I mean, it's a durable, yeah. Yeah, Joe. What about something like a violin where use appreciates it? Use appreciates it? That's very durable. That, that's sort of like the most extreme version of a durable because it's something where, like, you know, it, it, it actually using it adds to the value, but time is really going to depreciate it because if you don't <laughs> use it but and the time goes by. Either time also appreciates it. What? The older a violin is, the more valuable it is. Ah, I see what you're saying. Oh, the violin itself. Yeah. You think use appreciates violins? I think use depreciates violins. It's supposed to sound better once you use it more. <laughs> really just continuously forever? People will yeah. say things like, if you don't play a Stradivarius for like years, then I'll turn into a bad violin. <laughs> I see. Or you can talk about wine. We'll all sorts of dumb things about the longer you store it. Yeah, but wine clearly depreciates with use. <laughs> so it appreciates with use and it appreciates with time. I've never thought of an example That's like true. that. Hollow body guitars as well, actually. Yeah. Any like big wood. Yeah, That's true with the wood of the instrument. I don't know what to say about that. I've never thought of an example like that before. That's very interesting. Classic. <clears throat> Classic cars. I don't think they get better with use, though. If you take them out, they're going to start rusting. But if you don't use them, they'll stop working. You never want a classic car with a lot of miles on it. I mean, it's just kind of though an investment in maintenance in that case. I mean, I don't. I think that I would probably classify that as a durable. Because the truth is that even though maybe they last a long time, 
eventually that violin is going to break. Don't you think? Or rot. I mean, like, wood literally doesn't <laughs> last, wood doesn't last forever, like, <coughs> off of a tree. It doesn't even last forever on a tree. But it certainly doesn't last forever off a tree. I mean, I guess you could maintain it, but... You could try to maintain it, but you have to make some investment to maintain it. Yeah. So I would guess that that's basically a very strong durable. Durable, appreciate it first and then eventually depreciate? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of temporal <coughs> patterns that you can have. And we'll talk actually about the fact that over different time horizons, things might be durables versus storables. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I like these types of questions because the, the, a lot of the point of this lecture is like there's a lot of naive stuff in your Varian book, which is like, oh, everything is more elastic in the long run than in the short run. What you're starting to realize is like, Actually, the temporal patterns of these things are pretty subtle, and you really need to think about what I want you to be able to do in your minds is think about the real characteristics of the good and not just rely on this stupid claim by Varian, and instead, like, actually think through, like, oh, yeah, here's how this good works. Therefore, it's going to be durable over this duration, storable over that duration. That means we should expect the following things to happen. I want you to be able to use the language of economics to do that sort of stuff. So, okay. Uh, on the more personal side, things that are um, du somewhat durable are production processes. So like if you're used to doing something some way, it might take a while for that to depreciate. Um, personal relationships are this way too. You know, they last somewhat long, but you know, if you, they're not going to last as long as your education does. Right? So it's much easier to switch friends than it is to switch your education. Memories like explicit memories, not like things that are ingrained into you, like the way your education is, but just like individual things you remember have a much quicker die-off than, yeah, yeah, Philip. Uh, but don't explicit memories also have a type of the ultra-durable property where they're frequently recalled, they kind of get the duration refreshed? Yeah, explicit memories are a little bit complicated, but I, but I, for the purposes of like, everyday stuff, it can sort of like pop back up, but you don't have like command over it after, you know, weeks or months have passed usually. Except some things really get imprinted and then you can recall them, but. Um, okay. Then there's things that are in between which are variable. These are things that are neither durable nor storable. They're things that are totally, you can use them now and then you don't care whether it's, you know, one after another, or whether they're separated by a lot of time, that doesn't matter. Um, so unskilled labor, bulky raw materials, uh, advertising is like this, I, a lot of people think. Like, if you remind, if you make someone think that they like Coke uh, today, that like has essentially no effect on whether they're going to like Coke in the future, you have to like <laughs> remind them again that they like Coke. So a lot of advertising is like that. Re anything that's rentable, uh, that could be a durable but's rentable uh, is no longer a durable. Think about it, like a car is not a durable if I can just like rent, you know, Zipcar for example has made uh, cars much, much more variable rather than durable because you, it's now really easy to just get your car for the day and then not have a car the next day, right? So if you can really easily rent something, it's not a durable anymore. Um, similarly, something won't be a storable if you can easily buy and sell it with the market. So like something like a great bottle of wine sounds like it's a, dura a storable, right? Because it, you know, it lasts forever, maybe even gets better with time, but it, um, you can only use it a certain number of times. But if you can just sell that bottle perfectly back to the market and buy it when you want to consume it, and there's no loss to doing that, then there's nothing storable about it, right? You can just get it when you want it and not have it the next day and have as many as you want and so forth. Yeah, Tana. Great bottles of wine, especially old ones, there's a very finite supply. Well, that's true. From the global perspective, <coughs> but almost no individual is ever going to drink enough bottles, even of like the rarest wines, to like make a significant impact on their market price. I mean, maybe at the very, very, <laughs> very, very extreme, if, you know, there's some bottles from like the, you know, 18th century where there's like literally like five bottles and there's like one guy who plans in the course of his lifetime to drink all of those bottles. <laughs> but, but like, th that's not a very common like situation. Is it the world that will drink like that? Yeah, from the perspective of the world, they might be. Yeah. yeah. But from the perspective of an individual, they're not. Okay, 
Things that are somewhat storable are inventories of goods. Uh, so like, you know, if a firm uses up its current inventory, it can't sell those to people next month. It has to produce more, which is a little bit more costly. But, you know, it can produce more, so it's not that storable. Favors are storable. They don't last that long. Like, if you've done a favor for someone, they owe you back, but they'll probably forget if you don't use it pretty soon, right? Um, uh, discontinued consumer goods are somewhat storable. So I don't know if anyone's ever seen that Seinfeld episode about Elaine and her contraception. So there's like a type of contraception she really likes and she like doesn't like other types of contraception and it goes off the market and she has like a hundred units of this contraception left and she basically has to decide like is the guy good enough to like merit like her going to bed with him but she knows that she only has like a hundred units of this contraception left. Uh, so that's like a example of a you know, somewhat storable gun. But it's not like that storable because she probably could somewhere out there find it to get more of it if she really needed to, right? Um, some very storable things are exhaustible resources for the whole economy. So the greatest bottles of wine might be an exhaustible resource like that. There's only so much of it out there and we're just going to use it up. But other ex more standard exhaustible resources are oil, gas, copper. There's like only so much of that stuff out there basically. From the perspective of an individual, money is like the ultimate storable, right? Like if I have only so much money, I can use it today or I can use it tomorrow and you know, that's it. Great bottles of wine are, are another classic example as we went through. Okay, so why does all of this matter to us? Well, the reason, oh, actually, uh, Gautam, is Gautam here? No. Um, well, why does this matter to us? The key point is that the more that you can adjust things, the greater your reactions will be. So supply is going to be more elastic to shifts when you can adjust more things. And this is independent of whether the things that you're adjusting are literally the thing that you're consuming or whether they're a complement for the thing you're consuming or a substitute for it. So if, imagine the price of gasoline rises, right? Now, if you can adjust more things in your life, you'll be able to reduce your consumption of gasoline more. So for example, if you can change the amount that you're traveling, which is obviously a complement for gasoline, then you'll adjust more, right? You'll reduce the amount that you travel and that will uh, reduce the amount of gasoline you need to buy. Or you could buy something that's a substitute for gasoline, which is a cleaner car. If you can buy a cleaner car, you'll also react more to the change in the price of gasoline. This is called Le Chatelier's Principle. I don't know how many of you guys have taken chemistry and remember Le Chatelier's Principle, but it's the idea that if you, um, if a system is like allowed to adjust more things, if you can like allow more things to get loose and whatever, then it will, it will absorb more of the other chemical than it will if things are like more rigid, right? Because as more things are allowed to adjust, things are trying to accommodate the new environment, right? Just like they're trying to accommodate this higher price, the more things that can adjust, the more it will accommodate. Okay. And this is the driving force behind our analysis of duration. Supply will be more elastic over time frames when more things can be adjusted. Now the key question is how much adjustment occurs relative to the market opportunities. Because as we said, uh, if something is durable but it can be cheaply rented, then it's not really a durable. If it's storable but it can easily be purchased off the market like Elaine's contraception or if it can be uh, easily sold back to the market, then it's not really a, a storable. So in this sense, I think that durables are probably more common than storables in practice, but not because they are in principle, but because markets for most storable goods exist. And as a result of that, it's easier to sell them back and buy them. Okay. So uh, following this, we can define um, the notion of runs. Runs are going to be lengths of time over which you can adjust more or less things depending on uh, how many of those durable things can be adjusted in the relevant period of time. 
And each curve, the long run and the short run curves, correspond to a different duration of time over which a price changes. Because a supply curve is just telling you, right, uh, how much you produce on average per unit of time. And so you need to specify when you talk about the supply curve, are you talking about, you know, on average over one month if the price is this level, what are you going to do? Or on average over ten months if the price is this level, what are you going to do? So what the supply curve really has to correspond to is the supply curve for a certain temporal run, just as it corresponds to a certain product. Um, so more durables uh, can typically be adjusted the longer the run of production we're talking about is. Right? And there's no universal definition, but often we say that the short run corresponds to variable factors like unskilled labor, raw materials, with all things that are more durable than that being held fixed. The medium term corresponds to you can adjust plant sizes, production methods, etc. Uh, but anything that's longer term than that has to be held fixed. Whereas the long run allows new firms to enter into the industry and the supply of the factors of production, the things that the firm needs to buy, they might also increase in their availability and increase their production, increase their plants in order to accommodate themselves to the change in the, uh, the demand. So now all of these things of course are heuristics and there are many counterexamples. So for example, we think that you know, it on, it's only in the long term that new firms enter the industry. But you know, when Groupon came into the market and that people saw there was demand for online coupons, there were like within three months a thousand competitors for Groupon. Right? And that's why Groupon didn't do so well. Um, on the other hand, the medical industry, we think that, you know, adopting computers shouldn't take that long term, right? But the medical industry has taken forever to adopt computers. Well, other industries adopt them like almost as soon as they're available. Right? So a lot of things depend on the institutional and legal context in which things operate for whether a particular type of adjustment will happen in a short run or in the long run. And so therefore I think it's better rather than to say short run or long run to actually specify how many years you're talking about. So you can actually say is this a, you know, something that in this context will adjust in this run or in a, a, a longer run. Okay. So let's take a simple example. Yeah, Adam. Well, I was just going to ask. Um, so um, for the most part, has like technology reduced what we consider long term? Um, I think that that would overall be, be the case. But there are certainly some things that can become more storable, uh, sorry, uh, less storable as well because of technology. Uh, and some things that might be like more uh, long term as well. So for example, um, when you're starting a company now, it's much easier to enter quickly uh, if you're like relying on servers because you can, you don't need to have the servers physically in your building and that's a big invest, durable investment. You can just buy them from the cloud. But on the other hand, to build a server farm now is much more of a durable investment because you're not just buying some servers for your office, you have to buy this massive server farm that takes like 10 years to build or something like that, right? So some things become more uh, variable, but other things become more durable and they sort of shift where the durability lives in some sense rather than, you know, yeah. Mike, did you have a question? Yeah, it was kind of tangential about why uh, the medical industry hasn't implemented computers. Is it because like I think it a lot has to do with like the fact the American Medical Association has so much power, so they can like stand in the way of a lot of this stuff. It's kind of amazing, like you know, you like the you would never. I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys before. You would never want to like go to the librarian uh, and have them deliver your information to you. You go on Google and you have it do it. Why don't you do that with medical? I, I think I mentioned that to you guys before, right? This is kind of crazy. Um, okay, so let's consider a simple example of Le Chatelier's principle. Um, imagine that uh, we have a production function, which is that output is x to the point 0.4 times y to the point 
and imagine that both factor prices are one dollar. So that gives us a total cost, uh, if we just use the formulas that we had from the other day, of two times the output to the 1.25. Because the best thing we can do is produce equal amounts of these two things, <coughs> right? So then we're, if, uh, because they have, you know, equal factor prices and equal uh, productivities, right? And so if we do that, then y and x are equal, right? So it's going to be x or y to the 0.8 power. So then we invert that and then it cost us two times however much we need, right? Okay. So the marginal cost associated with that is 2.5 times the output to the power uh, 0.25, right? So in the long run, imagine that the price is 2.5. Well then the output is going to be equal to uh, 1 right? Because output is the inverse of the marginal cost, right? Uh, right? And we, if the price was equal to 2.5, divide by 2.5, that gives us 1, and so the output will be 1, right? And uh, x and y will uh, both be equal to 1, because we use equal amounts of the two of them. Okay. Now suppose that y is fixed in the short term. You can't adjust y. And you, it's chosen to be one to match that long-term equilibrium. <coughs> what is going to be the uh, short-term marginal cost? Uh, is Jake here? No, I think Jake dropped out of the class. Um, does anyone else want to try to solve for the uh, short-term marginal cost? Yeah, Tanner. So it'd be a two point five times the output to one point five. Uh, so why is that? Well, because the uh, current uh, cost, the, the total cost is yeah. equal to the output to the 2.5 plus 1, you set the cost equal to y. Yeah. So you take the root of that, and you get a 2.5 to the output. And the reason it's 2.5 is that the, at, the y is held fixed at 1. And so the output is equal to x to the 0.4. So then you have to invert that, and you get 2.5 out of that. Right? That's right. Um, and then the total cost is output to the 2.5, yes, plus 1, which is the cost of the y. So the marginal cost is 2.5, as Tanner said, uh, output to the 1.5. So there's two things to note here, right? Note that the long run marginal cost is much more elastic than the short run one is, right? The long run one has, you know, to the 0.25, that's going to actually be concave, right? and it's going to be very flat. This other one is going to be very convex because it's to the power of 1.5. But at equilibrium, at that long run price, the supply is exactly the same, right? Because if it's 2.5, this is output's going to be equal to 1. So at that long run place, if we're in the long term equilibrium, these things are exactly the same. They only differ when we're out of that long term equilibrium, right? And that last principle is called the envelope theorem. It says that even if we have something that's fixed, as long as it's fixed at its optimal value, the long run and the short run marginal costs are exactly the same. That's a very general principle of optimization that will be useful in your problem sets and so forth, that when you change one thing, but you hold the other thing fixed at its optimal level, you can ignore the effects coming through that thing or you can treat it as if it adjusted. It doesn't matter. It, treating if it adjusts or it doesn't adjust, you get the exact same result if it's at its optimal level. And we'll see why it's called the uh, envelope theorem in a moment. So here's just graphing on Mathematica what those things look like, right? The short run marginal cost is convex and somewhat inelastic. The long run is very elastic. You see how flat it is. Okay, so to understand why it's called the, sh the envelope theorem, let's compare the short and the long run average rather than marginal cost curves. Okay, so the long run average cost curve uh, is um, 2 times the output to the 0.25. 
right? How can we see that? Well, the total cost was 2 times the output to the 1.25. If we divide that by the output, we get to the uh, 0.25. How about the short run, uh, the short run average cost curve? Does anyone want to give that? So, uh, remind me of your name. Um, Julian. Julian, Julian, yeah. So it should be um, uh, 2.50 to the 1.5 plus 1 over O. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, where y, I've, I've put it slightly more general, so rather than 1, I put y there, right? So what the envelope theorem says is that the long run uh, average cost is the envelope of the short run average cost. So what do I mean by that? So here are the short run average costs for different values of y. And I've highlighted the optimal value of y that is chosen <coughs> along the long run curve at different points. And what you'll notice is that the, when the y is equal to its optimal value, these things just, just kiss each other. Right? They're just tangent at that point. So this thing is the envelope of all of these. What's the envelope? It's like you take all the tangent points as you run along it at the minimum. And that traces out the long run average cost curve. Does that make sense? And that principle exactly corresponds to what you, we, we said before, which is that at the optimum, the long and the short run marginal costs are identical. That exactly corresponds to the average cost being tangent at those points. Okay. And this is a really powerful principle that throws, shows up all over the place in economics. This is one of the most, I think, important principles in all of economics. So it's, it's very useful to pay attention to it. OK. So um, again, I want to try to interpret these different responses in terms of different duration shifts in price, right? So the reason when we say things are more elastic in the long run, what we mean is that if the price were to change for a long period, the quantity supplied on average over that period would change by more than if the prices were to change for a short period. And that's all that a run means. When you, you know long run, what does that mean? What, what does run mean? Run means a run of production. Right? Uh, I mean, you've, you've heard people say, oh, we're going to do a run for three months of this thing, or this movie will run for four months. A short run is a short run. <laughs> a long run is a long run. I mean, it's it's... It's very simple, actually. But uh, I, I think people don't really know what run means, usually. And, and th that's the right way to, uh, <coughs> to interpret it. OK. So um, but if we take things seriously in terms of time, if we really want to talk about time, uh, we need to ask some basic questions. So like, what is the relationship between the length uh, of, the, of time and whether a good is durable or not. Um, what would be short-term reactions to a long-term <coughs> shift? So what do I mean by that? What happens in like the first few months after we learn that things are going to be different for a long time? Um, what are th what's the long-term effect of there being many short-term shifts? Uh, what happens if it's unclear how long a short-term shift is going to endure, or a, whether it is short-term or long-term, right? <coughs> what does the actual path over time of people adjusting to a shift look like? Now, it's popular in economics, and you'll learn in your next two courses in macro <coughs> how to study these things using dynamic models. Dynamic models are ones that explicitly include time. You know, there's today, there's tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. We don't do that in our models. All the models in this class we're going to study are going to be static. They're going to just say, here is what the price is. Here is what the quantity is, right? Now, those models are much simpler. You don't have to worry in all these complicated ways about time. Um, and it can get very confusing to keep track of what's going on in all these different periods. So what I'm going to try to do today is give you a sense of how you can think in a quite interesting and powerful way about what goes on over time just using static models with different temporal durations.
And you'll see that a lot of the things we can say about what goes on over time, you can understand just by thinking about static models with different temporal durations using the analysis we did in class. Okay. And in fact, when you go into macro and you're doing all these really, really complicated dynamic programming problems, you may want to come back to some of the principles that you learned in this class and just think about, well, that's a long term, this is a short term, and how should we think from our basic intuitions from static models about what's going to happen. Okay. The basic key to this is to realize that all a static model is is an average of a dynamic world. Remember how I said that price theory tends to think about things in a way that's aggregated up, thinks about averages of things? Well, time is really just something that you can either take an average over a long period of time or you can chop time up finely. What price theory does is it averages over time periods. Dynamic theories tend to chop things up and want to think about what goes on at each period individually. So really, dynamic models and static models, static models, it sounds static, it sounds like it's a very short period of time, that's not right. Static model means an average over a long period of time. Whereas dynamic models want to think about each moment separately. Okay, so let's talk about some types of um, shifts that can occur in demand and how firms will react to those different types of shifts. So one type of shift is a one-time permanent change in demand. So like when the iPad came into fashion, that just permanently reduced the demand for paper, right? And people sort of knew that that would last forever. There can also be one-time temporary shifts, such as the like recent trends for cupcakes, though I think this is getting a little dated now. I think cupcakes have already gone out of fashion. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I don't know what the like current trendy dessert is. Maybe donuts or cronuts, cronuts, cronuts right? So that's like a one-time temporary increase in demand. Things can also increase in what's called the secular trend. What secular trend means, it has nothing to do with whether it's religious or not. Secular trend means that it's like gradually going up over time for a long period of time. So like for example, the demand for medical care, people are living longer, there's just a gradual, and people are getting wealthier, they're willing to spend more to stay alive longer, there's gradual increase in demand for medical care. As well as for education, because people in the developing world are now coming into the educational market wanting to get top degrees. That's a, that's a secular trend. <coughs> Things can also move in predictable cycles. So for example, the demand for vacations is a very famous cyclical demand, right? Because people want to take vacations during like the school vacation times and not during the term. And electricity has high demand during the summer and somewhat high demand during the winter and low demand during the fall and spring. Now, a thing to notice is that if something is durable and the demand for it has predictable cycles, that will make it much costlier. Why? Durables don't like to have rapid changes, right? And so it's going to be costly to have rapid changes with the durable. So how does that play out here? Well, how, Mike, do you want to say something about that or no? Did, yeah, Philip. Well, I think I know something about electricity. Yeah. What often companies do was they'll use some relatively predictable, very durable type of method to produce the base electricity that's always demanded, such as uh, a hydroelectric dam or yeah. in particular a coal, coal, file, coal, coal fired plant or a nuclear plant is a yeah. good one of these and then they'll use some plant that has can be ramped up very quickly yeah. uh, for the spiky demand such as a natural gas fire. And those ramped up ones are always more expensive, yeah. right? And so the fact that something that wants to be durable is being forced to respond to these spikes it makes it more expensive. Although right. I think due to the new natural gas... Uh, well, so it, it may be changing. Kind of change, but when yeah. they were built, they were definitely yeah. more expensive. Yeah. But, I mean, all, but more, more importantly, I think, like, you just have to build a giant bunch of giant plants. And you can't like, build more plants at the moment when there's more demand. You have to like, you, know, you can put more stuff into it, but because there's these big plants that have to be built, like that's just going to make it more expensive if there are cycles than if there were constant amounts and you could build the amount that was perfect for all times. Similarly, vacations 
are really, really expensive in places that don't have any other industry. And they're less expensive relative to like the overall real estate price in places where uh, there is business travelers as well, right? Because then the demand, because hotels are lumpy, right? And you want to keep sort of constant demand, but if they have to make all their money to like recover the cost of the hotel in the vacation season when they have booking, it's going to be very expensive, right? So anything that is durable but that faces cyclic demand is going to be very expensive relative to what it would be if you could have constant demand but the same amount of demand, right? So durables don't like to have these bumps. On the other hand, storables like to have these bumps, right? So a storable, if you had to like consume that peak amount of demand all the time of oil, <coughs> it would be much more expensive than if you have sometimes people want oil, sometimes people don't want oil. Because storables actually like to have these, or you know, vacations would actually probably be like less enjoyable if you didn't have some cycle to them. Because you would be all constantly going on vacation. And that wouldn't be actually all that interesting, right? So in fact, the optimal production of storables will usually involve some sort of a cycle of using it. Things can also move in an unpredictable cycle, such as the demand for men's underwear. Why is that? Well, demand for men's underwear tends to follow the business cycle. When a lot of people are un when a lot of men are unemployed, they tend not to buy new underwear. It turns <laughs> out, uh, and they just use the, they scrimp and they use their old underwear and let it like disintegrate, right? <laughs> um, and uh, um, the business cycle is pretty unpredictable, so the demand for men's underwear is, follows a pretty unpredictable cycle. Um, demand can also move erratically, uh, sort of like with no good pattern. So like a lot of fashion demand is that way. Uh, demand for gold, diamonds, etc. Okay. Now, um, it's not only the expected duration of a shock, but the time since the shock occurred that matters. For example, there can be lags after there's a shock in returning to the equilibrium before the shock. So imagine demand goes up temporarily for a while, but then it takes a while to ramp down. Now, the simplest example would be like cupcakes. There's like all these cupcake stores built, and what's going to probably happen is as the demand for cupcakes go down, they'll sort of persist for a while. Their prices will fall, you know, and they'll take a while to eliminate all those cupcake stores that got built. But I think my favorite example happens during civil wars or other violent episodes. Uh, Mike, this thing's flashing. Um, so uh, drug demand dramatically increased in, Me demand to ship drugs through Mexico dramatically increased because the U.S. cracked down on what used to happen, which is the Colombians used to fly uh, planes full of drugs to the U.S. And then there was a big crackdown on that. And that led and they've been trained to be very violent, right? So what they've done, given that the uh, amount of profits they can make in the drug trade has gone down, is they've gone into other areas, like um, kidnapping, uh, etc., because there's no longer the profitability here, but they're trained in this violence. So the, even though the demand for the violence, in some sense, has dissipated now, there's the long process of readjusting to the equilibrium. Similarly, countries that have had a civil war almost always have years of like just criminality after that civil war because it takes a while for those people to adjust back to society and go to other things. So even though the demand for violence has gone down, the violence will persist because there's this durability that causes you know it to be intertemporal complements. Yeah. Consistency in like the overall durability of things like violence. Like if you were to compare, I don't know, like Cambodia and Mexico after you know peace periods. Violence tend to, you know, yeah, it, it would be interesting. I think it depends a lot on the educational institutions of the country, right? So if you have really good retraining programs, that decreases the durability of education. If you have really good military, that also decreases the durability of education. So having educational institutions, I think, is a really important way to change the durability of that. So like a lot of, you know, Colombia has had this big thing about like retraining guerrillas, 
uh, from the Civil War to try to avoid that problem. Um, okay. Uh, so it takes a long time for this sort of violent human capital to depreciate. But there can also be lags in getting to the post-shock equilibrium. So there's both ones in coming back from it, but also getting to it. So, for example, I think probably Google's market dominance was largest about six years ago, not today, uh, because now they have Facebook and all these other things that have, like, but their, the actual size of their workforce is continually growing. Why is that? Because it's taken a while for them to hire people. I mean, they, they were only a few years old six years ago, right? And so it took a while for them to establish an HR division, to hire the people for the HR division. Those people that they hired in the HR division could then hire people. And then, you know, they had to build campuses for the people. All these things are highly durable, right? So Google's still catching up to the big shock to demand that it faced, right? There can also be lags in adjusting to or away from cyclicality. So for example, it used to be that there was like this need for all these migrant workers to come to California. Now that agriculture has ways that they can sustain it <coughs> over longer periods of time, that it's not as seasonal, and also the seasonality of the demand is cushioned by all these foreign imports. So they could just have more of a permanent workforce in California now, but they're used to having cycles. And so they had all these immigrant workers coming. And so just like the process of changing away from having cycles itself can have a lag, right? So. What I'm trying to show you is that like, by putting together different of these temporal aspects that we're learning in different combinations, you can explain a lot of phenomena. So one really cool example of this uh, is the cyclical pattern of demand for cattle, of, or of supply of cattle. So this shows, as a function of the number of, uh, over time, what the number of cattle in the United States has been. And you see it follows this very regular cycle seems weird. It doesn't have anything particularly to do with the business cycle. What's going on? Well, think about how cattle work. Imagine there's like a big upsurge in the demand for beef today. What will happen? Well, if it's very short-lived, you'll probably kill more cows today to serve that demand. But if it's going to last for a little bit longer, what would you do? You'd actually have less beef supplied to the market today. Why? So you can have more cows breed, so you can supply more beef to the market tomorrow. Right? And if it's extremely long lived, you know, uh, whatever. So the point is that uh, a shock to demand today can cause ripples for many years because you'll get more in the future and then you'll slaughter that and then that will reduce the number that you have and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, so far, beyond our initial discussion, I've focused on um, durable uh, inputs. But now I want to talk about an extreme counterexample, which is oil, which is like a super, super, super storable input, right? Because oil can essentially costlessly be stored in the ground, but it's very uh, cheap to extract it, uh, except for fracking. But I mean, for the like Saudi Arabia and so forth, it's very cheap to extract. If there's no cost of extraction, then the price of the oil has to rise at exactly the interest rate. And can anyone tell me why that is? Uh, Rishi. Um, so if there's no cost of extraction, then if you sell the oil today, yeah. and you know, it's, you know the price is going to rise later on, you want to make sure that what you sell it for today is at least as much as what you would have gotten for it when you, sell it later, when you would have sold it later. Exactly. And, and the difference between today and tomorrow is however much you can earn saving that money. Right? On the other hand, if it were cheaper today, uh, then you would just sell the oil tomorrow and borrow the money that you need today. Yeah, remind me of your name? Maury. Maury. Uh, I was just wondering, what if there were a cost of extraction? Like, how would that affect? So then it has to be that the rent that you get is, grows at this interest rate. The rent that you get is the amount um, that you get on the market minus the cost of extraction. So that difference has to grow at the interest rate. Okay. That's called the, the, the rent, the oil, the uh, exhaustible rent. Uh, yeah, Philip. Uh, that would be assuming that the cost of extraction is just a constant and you can yes. cut a large amount. Well, but, okay, so if it's not a constant, then you need that 
the, mar the rent on the marginal unit that you uh, extract grows at the interest rate. Okay, so um, there, if there's a temporary shock, uh, note that all prices through, for the rest of time will move uh, proportionally. <coughs> Why is that? Well, imagine that there's like suddenly a surge in demand for oil, but it only lasts for a few weeks, right? In order for this equation to still be the case, all prices have to rise for all of the rest of the future uh, by however much they rise today, because otherwise everyone would put all their oil on the market right now, right? And so that means that if oil rises for a short period of time, the demand for oil rises, there can be almost no increase in price. Because you can't have like for a very short increase in demand that like oil for the rest of time is going to be more expensive, right? And so what that means is that the oil price hardly moves at all and to accommodate that demand it's almost all an increase in quantity. Which means extremely, extremely elastic supply in that short term. Right? It's basically like any demand is just completely accommodated by an increase in supply. Yeah, Philip. Um, in the real world, since yeah. OPEC uh, commands market power, is that why we see uh, large su spikes and cycles like oil hitting 110 pretty quickly? Well, so, I mean, OPEC does have some incentives to do that. What they actually want to do is set the marginal revenue uh, uh, to grow at the interest rate. <laughs> But the, they'll only have an incentive to raise prices in response to a demand shock if it makes demand more inelastic, not if it just increases the total quantity of demand. And it's not clear that most demand increases make demand more elastic, inelastic. The question is, like, has the average willingness of people to pay gone up? Or is it just that there are more people who want to buy it, like more total demand? I don't know. And sometimes if there can be more demand and actually people are more elastic. You know, for example, during a recession, imagine that there's a recession, but it's also the summertime. Well, people will have more demand for gas, but they'll also be cheaper. You know, they won't want to pay as much. And then you might actually lower the price. So it's not, it's not completely obvious. Yeah, so Tanner. So one of those on these wild swings. Yeah. It occasionally does, like, like a lot of commodities. What do you attribute that to? Speculation? Uh... About potential future shocks. I mean, that's the reason why oil does go on those wild swings. Think about it. All the prices need to be the same over time. So that means any information that you get about any future uh, demand shock could cause a price to change for no apparent reason today. So that's why oil is so volatile and other things are much more stable, is because they're, those are more durable, it's affected by immediately apparent factors, not by these crazy things about the future demand. Um, and so everyone says that's speculation, but it, it's just the law of exhaustible resources. And that's incredibly logical, and it's socially valuable that that happens. Because imagine that we learn that there's going to be a huge amount of demand for oil in the future. If the price of oil didn't suddenly rise today, then we would be using way too much oil today and not saving it for the future. Right? It's like if you were to learn that, um, imagine like you have some booze and like you don't have uh, access to a fake ID. <coughs> And you suddenly learn that, like, you know, there's some, uh, you know, potential romantic partner who you want to, like, throw a party for uh, sometime in the future. Well, you're going to stop drinking your booze today, right, so that you can save it for that time in the future, right? Uh, and uh, in the same way, like, the economy should save its oil if we suddenly learn that there's going to be uh, a real need for oil in the future, right? On the other hand... I think that this uh, shows us, so this shows you that demand is much, much more elastic in the short term than in the long term for an exhaustible resource that's very storable like this. It also has some really important lessons for climate policy. So imagine that we just put a uniform tax on oil that's going to last forever. That's basically going to do nothing, right? Because the price will just rise. All the prices will rise, but it's not going to change when we consume the oil. We're going to consume the oil at some point, right? What really matters is the timing of the oil tax. So if you say we're going to have a high tax now, but then it's going to go down over time, that will get us to consume the oil much in the future rather than today. Yeah, go ahead, well, Julian. In the book, it said that 
uh, the like the price at the end of time depends on uh, what you would be replacing oil with. Um, yeah. So if the tax increase results in like more development of renewables, which then reduces the price of renewables because the technology gets better, then wouldn't have. Well, I guess it, I that that would be actually worse. So that that that's actually the really bad thing. Imagine <laughs> that oil is going to be cheap in the like there's going to be no use for oil in the future, then you'll use even more today. So actually, the devel expecting development of renewables in the future can actually worsen the climate change problem. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, no? Remind me of your name? Dick. Dick. Uh, the wire oil, why would you explain oil prices rising over time, and especially in the past, say, 10 or 20 years? I'm not really an expert on the oil market, but I would guess that what's happening is people are expecting instability in the... Well, that wouldn't necessarily do it, actually. Actually, people are expecting the Middle East to get more stable. Because what could happen is then, then the, the, the cost of extracting it from the Middle East will be lower in the future than it is today. And that'll mean people don't want to extract it today. I mean... It's really, it's a complicated problem. You see what I mean? To even interpret what's going on, like you can see why it's hard to be an oil analyst because you really need to think about all these factors. Oh, so if it's cheaper to get oil in the future, then... If it's cheaper to extract the oil in the future, then you want to extract it in the future rather than today. That makes it more expensive today. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah Christian. I mean, don't you think it could just be the, like what we talked about, the anticipation of future regulations and taxes on oil? Like, say, or the anticipation of, I, I actually, I genuinely think the anticipation of, yeah, so the question is, if people don't anticipate us developing renewables, so like, for example, if you anticipate, imagine that people thought that in like five or ten years, we might get Kyoto. But now, suddenly people are like, oh shit, Kyoto is not going to happen at all. Like, like we're not going to do anything about climate change. That could actually cause the price of oil to go up today <coughs> because now they no longer think that there's going to be all these renewables that would lead us to want to consume our oil today. Oh. So, I mean, yeah, so that, like, this is the really cool thing about the economics of this stuff is if you really learn to think about it, you can really interpret what's going on. I mean, I haven't thought through it. We're sort of just thinking through it on the fly here, right? But it gives you this whole set of tools it's not about the mathematics. It's about the tools that you're going to get that are going to be able to make you like a really valuable person for a company to hire because they're going to be able to like, you're going to be able to say things about this that they wouldn't be able to think of. You know what I mean? Okay. So oil and other exhaustible resources are an extreme but very important case. And I think there's like a much broader lesson here about economics. So like, for example, in macro, you learn that the long-term supply curve is vertical, right? Whereas the short-term supply curve could be more horizontal, right? But this is exactly the exhaustible resource model. On the other hand, you learn that everything in micro is more elastic in the long run than in the short run. So why should the economy as a whole be more elastic in the short term than in the long term? Well, it's based on this idea that there's like a fixed amount of stuff we have, and we either consume it today or we consume it tomorrow, and we can't increase it. Is that really realistic? Imagine that like currently there's no demand, and so like all of the people are employed, and therefore their skills start going to crap. Then there's not going to be as much ability to produce tomorrow because people's skills won't be as good. Or imagine that like everybody's unemployed, and so there's no like people developing new technologies then we'll, that will reduce the production in the future as well. Yeah, Philip? But what about uh, all those unemployed people start going to college instead? Well, so then it could have the opposite. I mean, you see, like this, this, uh, th this idea in macro is based on like one incredibly, incredibly stylized assumption about what like the supply side of the economy looks like. And all the micro results are based on exactly the opposite completely stylized assumption of what the economy looks like. One's based on complete storability, one's based on complete durability. And they're all just like, oh yeah, well that's sort of how it is. There's like no real discussion of like why that assumption is being made, whether it's realistic given the things that you're talking about, etc. Right? So th there's like 
these two things that you learn are completely inconsistent with one another. And yet you learn them both as if they're completely obvious. Right? So like, I, one of the fun things about preparing this lecture was I was basically going to try to teach you these two things. I was trying to think, how the hell are these consistent with one another? And then I realized, well, it depends on whether things are intertemporal complements or substitutes. And, you know, if you learn to actually think through this stuff, rather than just take what your book tells you, you know, you'll have much more power to really come up with something that makes sense and to critically evaluate the ideas you get. Almost any time you see a result in an economics book and it seems like it came from heaven and you sort of don't understand why, it's almost always because there's some really strong assumption being made uh, that maybe not that realistic. So you, you, almost get, you almost never get something for nothing. It's almost always coming out of some assumption you're making. Uh, and so you should really view economics as a toolbox for thinking about the world around you rather than a set of like conclusions that you should just impose. So...